Um, Blake, Blake Martin will be uh, talking uh, about uh, um, COVID, Omicron, and, and children, and Ken Gersing will be talking about a new initiative. But first thing, uh, the usual uh, concept, uh, Q&A button to post uh, questions, uh, use the chat if you're inspired, uh, both seem to work uh, very nicely. Uh, presentation will be recorded and archived in the uh, uh, CD2H YouTube channel. Next slide, please. Um, so the upcoming presentations, we have uh, extracting patient level social determinants of health in the OMOP uh, uh, CDM uh, by Jim Fong. Um, week after that, on uh, the uh, 31st, term hub con con concept set comparison analysis and authoring by uh, Siegfried Gold, uh, 7th, November 7th, uh, there's uh, no, no, uh, no meeting. November 14th, impact of COVID-19 on clinical outcomes amongst acute uh, myocardial infarction patients undergoing early invasive treatment by Sula Mazimba. Uh, 21st is Thanksgiving. And the 29th is HIV, COVID, and social determinants of health leveraging M3C resources for an R01. Okay, that seems like a good thing with the group of people uh, doing that. Okay, so Blake Martin will be talking for 30 minutes uh, on acute uh, upper airway disease in children with Omicron uh, variant uh, B11529 variant of uh, uh, SARS uh, CoV 2A. Uh, and then uh, uh, Ken Versing will be talking about a uh, new uh, public health initiative involving uh, uh, contracting uh, investigators to answer high impact questions. And he'll be talking uh, for 20 minutes. Okay, so Blake, I, I assume you have slides and, and share your screen. Perfect. All right. Let's see, is that showing up for everybody? Beautiful. Very good. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all today about our work looking at acute upper airway disease in children with the Omicron variant um, using N3C data. There we go. Um, so just a quick overview. We're going to be talking really about uh, the data and results from a publication in JAMA PEDS from uh, April that our research group put together. Um, in terms of like sort of more recent data, we're working on kind of updating the pipe pipeline to you know give us more recent results. Um, so stay tuned for kind of more up to date results as the sub variant changed over time. Um, in terms of what I'm hoping to talk about today, first I'll just go through a little bit about the clinical entity of upper airway infection, what, what we mean when we say that, talk a little bit about sort of changing SARS-CoV-2 replication and why there might be a biologically plausible mechanism for why children with Omicron specifically might be at higher risk for upper airway infection in the setting of SARS-CoV-2. Um, we'll talk about the population that we were looking at, some specific definitions, our development of an upper airway infection or UAI concept set, um, talk about the statistical methods that we used to um, do our comparisons. We'll go through uh, some specific comparisons in terms of children with uh, upper airway infection in the sort of pre-Omicron era and compare those to children in the Omicron era. And we'll look at uh, differences in demographics as well as comorbidities. And uh, most importantly, we'll look at how the, the, this UAI entity has changed over time. Um, so a very brief primer on kind of the upper respiratory system here. Uh, when we breathe in, gas comes in through either the nasopharynx or the, uh, uh, or the uh, oropharynx. It passes the epiglottis into the trachea and then goes down the right and left main stem bronchi to the respective lungs. And so when I say upper airway infection, I really mean any sort of infection or inflammation that affects these large airways. And so that'll include conditions such as laryngotracheal bronchitis, which we commonly just call viral croup, um, tracheitis, um, inflammation or infection of the trachea, epiglottitis, infection or inflammation oh. of this little flap that kind of overlies the airway and keeps us from aspirating when we're swallowing. And then lastly, infection or inflammation of the sub or supraglottic areas, which are regions, regions just below and above the glottic opening of the larynx. Um, 
So just a real quick diagram of like why croup is bad and why it tends to cause more severe disease in children. So when you're looking from above at the normal larynx, you see here the vocal cords. Um, and then if you're looking at a cross section, you can see the larynx here. And so air goes in and out here. Um, in a child who has croup, you get inflammation and swelling of the vocal cords, as well as narrowing of not just the glottic opening, but also the trachea and then the bronchi as well, which you can't see here. And so when you look at a cross section of the trachea in a healthy airway, this lumen is nice and open here. And so there's easy inspiration and expiration of gas. However, in the setting of croup or any sort of viral or bacterial infection of the large airways, you get uh, increased secretions, you get edema and inflammation of the epithelium, as well as the smooth muscle, and this causes narrowing of the lumen. Um, now, why that might not seem like a huge deal in, with you know, a trachea that's very large, um, for a child, it actually can be quite significant. So specifically, if we remember our, our fluid dynamics, the resistance of gas flow is proportional to the inverse of the radius squared. So what that means is that if we half the diameter, half the radius of a child's airway because of uh, secretions or inflammation uh, of soft tissue, that's going to cause a 16-fold increase in the resistance to airflow. Um, and so children and babies who have smaller airways to begin with, they're at particularly higher risk for airway obstruction, which can lead to hypoxemia and even cardiac arrest in severe cases. And so as it became more clear that the Omicron virus was causing, you know, overall slightly less severe disease than prior variants such as Delta, uh, one of the hypotheses was that the site of tissue tropism, the site of viral replication was changing. Um, and that was demonstrated really nicely in this paper from early uh, 2022, in which uh, they looked at the um, I guess the, the quantity of virus that was being produced during replication in different parts of the human airway. And so there's a really nice image from that study here where you can see on the left uh, in the bronchi that there is a significantly higher viral load uh, of patients that were infected with the Omicron variant compared to those with Delta or the wild type variant. Um, conversely, when you look in the lower airways, uh, sort of further down into the lung, there is lower viral load of Omicron compared to Delta or wild type. And so while that might be you know, overall good for adults and uh, less severe disease from hypoxemic respiratory failure from COVID-19 pneumonia, this does provide a plausible biologic mechanism whereby you could have increased viral replication in the larger airways, such as the trachea uh, and bronchi, which could put children at higher risk for severe, severe disease. Um, this is a, a nice immunohistochemical staining where they looked at patients infected with different subvariants. And on the left here, you can see the bronchi, and on the right here, you can see the, lo the lower respiratory tract. And so you can see here that there's just a significantly higher viral load uh, for patients when they're infected with Omicron variants in the bronchi compared to um, in lower airways. Um, the idea of there being croup or upper airway infection in children with COVID is not a new phenomenon. So even as far back as 2020 and into 2021, we saw all these case reports of you know, one or two patients who were diagnosed with having croup and who are also testing positive for COVID-19. And so given the, you know, the increasing frequency of these case results, along with plausible biological mechanism, uh, we had a hypothesis, which was that there would be an increase in pediatric UAI rates among SARS-CoV-2 positive children within the N3C with the emergence of the Omicron as the predominant variant. And so really our objective was to uh, flush out how many children were developing or being, I should say, receiving a UAI diagnosis among those children who had a positive SARS-CoV-2 test. What were the sort of demographic and comorbidities of those children? And how were things changing over time? Um, in terms of identifying specific uh, patients and patient level encounters for the project, we leveraged a very similar uh, pipeline that we used for the N3C PEDS cohort um, project. Specifically, we were looking at patients who were less than 19 years old at the time of their first SARS-CoV-2 test, uh, and then that those children had to have a positive SARS-CoV-2 PCR antigen or antibody test. And we defined the pre-Omicron era as being those patients whose encounter uh, occurred between March 1st of 2020 up through December 25th of 2021. And then the Omicron era being patients uh, whose data we had that occurred on or after December 26th of 2021. Um, and the reason for that particular cutoff was based on uh, variant sequencing done by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that showed that for the two week period ending on December 25th uh, of 2021, that that is the point at which the Omicron variant became the predominant uh, variant that was sequenced. 
Um, in order to identify children who had an upper airway infection, we had to develop a new concept set. And really, we wanted it to be quite broad and sensitive uh, to capture any child who you know, both had a positive SARS-CoV-2 test, but also had any type of infectious or inflammatory condition that was acutely affecting their upper airways. And so you can see a sample uh, of some of the diagnoses there. So anything from epiglottitis to viral tracheitis to laryngotracheobronchitis or croup. Um, we did also specifically include bacterial tracheitis conditions. Um, and the reason for this is that, you know, first clinically, it can be very challenging to differentiate which children have, you know, viral croup versus bacterial tracheitis because we don't often culture the secretions from the larger airways. Um, and the second piece of this is that bacterial tracheitis itself can be a complication of viral croup. And so it's tough to know exactly what is causing the, the, the more severe disease. And so we developed a concept set that really was going to bring in children affected with any sort of acute inflammatory or infectious condition that was affecting the larger airways. Um, in terms of our statistical approach, uh, really wasn't anything too fancy. We used chi-square and Fisher exact tests to compare uh, categorical variables between the pre-Omicron and Omicron eras. We used moods, median, and t-tests for continuous variable comparisons as appropriate. Uh, and then in order to determine the change over time in percent of children with SARS-CoV-2 who received one of these UAI diagnoses, we used linear reg regression. Um, so in terms of results and kind of breaking things down by variant era here, um, you'll see here that in the pre-Omicron era, there were 206 patients that had a positive SARS-CoV-2 test um, and who, uh, you know, fell in that particular time period and who had a UAI diagnosis compared to 178 patients in the Omicron time period. Um, and when you look at just the pure proportions here, you do see that there is a significant increase in the percentage or proportion of children who were given a UA di diagnosis among those children with SARS-CoV-2 in the Omicron era. Um, in terms of other you know, particular demographic differences, we saw that children were more likely to be younger among UAI cases during the Omicron era at, with a mean of 2.1 years compared to 4.4 years in the pre-Omicron era. And we also saw that children were more likely to be Hispanic or Latino at 35.4% compared to 18.9% in the pre-Omicron era. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have large enough numbers within the Omicron era to really you know, dive down significantly into comorbidity risk factors. And so really not able to comment too much on how things like obesity or diabetes or asthma um, uh, uh, affected the receipt of a UAI diagnosis by era. Um, and, you know, interestingly, when we looked at the severity of these encounters, and so by severe disease, we use the same definition we used in the PEDS and 3C cohort paper, which is that a child is hospitalized and requires either invasive ventilation, vasopressor, inotropic support, or ECMO, or they experience mortality. And then moderate SARS-CoV-2 disease are those patients who are hospitalized but don't require any of those supportive measures uh, or experience mortality. And so we compared the pre-Omicron versus Omicron UAI patients. We find that actually the vast majority of, of children in Omicron era experienced moderate disease. So when you specifically look at hospitalized children, thankfully most of them were not requiring things like inv invasive ventilation or vasopressor support or ECMO uh, or experiencing mortality. And again, we didn't really have the large enough numbers uh, to dive into you know, why the handful of patients who did have severe disease had severe disease only really enough to comment that, you know, for the most part, these patients, though hospitalized, were not severely ill. Um, and I think, you know, concordant with that is the fact that a lower proportion of children with UAI received dexamethasone in the Omicron era compared to the pre-Omicron era. Um, and, you know, for, uh, you know, people that uh, are not in the pediatric area, dexamethasone, while it is the medicine that is used for COVID-19. It's also the primary medication that we use in pediatrics for things like croup. Um, and so, you know, concordant with patients having less severe disease, they're also less likely to receive dexamethasone during the Omicron era. Um, this chart here demonstrates how the percent of all total SARS-CoV-2 um, cases with UAI changed over time. So you can see here for hospitalized patients with the solid line, it starts at a little under 2% um, and ends in January of 2022 at a little over 4%. Um, when you look at patients whose maximum clinical severity was in the outpatient or ED realm, that increases among outpatients, outpatients from you know, about 3% up to a little over 1% at the end of the study period. Um, and just pointing out here that it was in December of 2021 when that Omicron variant really became the predominant variant. So you can see here that it does kind of continue to increase as Omicron becomes the predominant variant. Uh, when you look at the 
numbers associated with linear regressions, we see that there is on average a 0.6% increase in the rate of uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive children who had UAI among hospitalized cases and 0.2% among those outpatient or ED cases. I think one thing that's sort of interesting here is, I mean, especially when you look at the outpatient, uh, the outpatient realm, um, it does seem like it's kind of gradually increasing even before you get to the Omicron period. So I think there might be something else going on there besides just the the the, the variant and something particular to uh, the data or the healthcare system. When you look at the hospitalized patients, you know, it's it's a little bit less clear, but you definitely see higher numbers as Omicron becomes predominant. Um, so, you know, what does this tell us? I think we have seen an increase in children with SARS-CoV-2 and these UAI diagnoses during the Omicron era as compared to the pre-Omicron era. In general, those children who are affected tended to be younger and were more likely to be Hispanic or Latino. And when we focus in on those hospitalized children, we saw more moderate and less severe disease among children than the Omicron era. And con concordant with that, they were less likely to receive dexamethasone, which is the primary treatment for viral croup. Um, you know, I think some important limitations to the study, uh, one is always attribution. A, a lot of these children tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, but they could have had another condition that led to their diagnosis of upper airway infection. So um, children that had parainfluenza or RSV, other viruses that cause viral croup or upper airway obstruction or upper airway infection, those could also be the primary drivers among, you know, some percentage of these patients. Additionally, I think the low case numbers during the Omicron era, at least that we have so far, <laughs> um, did make it difficult to dive deeper into things like you know, race as a severity risk factor, uh, comorbidities as a severity risk factor. It made it really difficult for us to dive into what was happening to those patients with severe disease among children hospitalized with UAI during the Omicron area. Um, but I do think that this, you know, leads us to some important future directions, which we're going to continue to work on. One is, you know, assessing for co-infection. So can we suss out if children who are or are not diagnosed with another viral lo upper lower respiratory tract infection, are they more or less likely to have a diagnosis of, of croup or UAI? Um, similarly, we know in non-SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral infections that cause croup that children with cardiac disease or neurologic disease are more likely to experience uh, se higher severity or complications from viral croup or UAI. And so as we get more numbers, my hope is we can dive a little bit more into are these children with complex chronic conditions more likely to develop severe disease uh, with SARS-CoV-2 UAI. Um, and, you know, in addition to just comorbidities, I think diving further into severity risk factors um, could really help providers in the clinic or in the emergency department figure out which of these children need dexamethasone, which of these children need closer monitoring or even hospitalization. Um, and ideally, that's something that'll drive improvements in care going forward. I um, want to thank all of the uh, co-authors and the institutions involved. So Peter DeWitt and Seth Russell from, Uni from University of Colorado, uh, Nelson Sanchez Pinto from Northwestern, um, Melissa Handel and Tal Bennett also from University of Colorado, and then Richard Moffitt from um, Stony Brook University, in addition to a lot of other people uh, from the N3C and certainly all the N3C contributing sites uh, and patients whose data we used for the project. Um, and so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, questions? Do have anybody in the chat? Q&A? So I, I have a question about the histology. The, those, those were actually really interesting. <laughs> um, so maybe you can talk a little bit more if, if, where the study came from and what the end was. I mean, that, that was, you know, quite, that seemed quite dramatic. Yeah. Um, so by no means am I a biochem biochemical expert, um, but you know my understanding is that, so this was a, a study that came out of Nature in, in January of this year, um, and they looked at uh, ex vivo viral replication uh, by different subvariants of SARS-CoV-2 in different parts of the respiratory tract. And so they specifically looked at, um, so this is, uh, well, I guess this slide here was looking at the quantity of um, virus that was identified in the supernatant uh, after they grew virus in, uh, within the bronchi versus in lower respiratory tract or alveoli. And they did it for a bunch of different subvariants. I'm only showing you here the ones that involve the Omicron virus. Um, but here it's it's literally just like an immunohistochemical stain against um, uh, one of the main nucleocapsid proteins from SARS-CoV-2, uh, just to give you sort of visual sense of where Omicron was replicating uh, and you can see, you know, it's 
a lot more, there's a much higher density of the immunohistochemical stain in the bronchi compared to um, in the alveoli and, and bronchioles. So I'm not a biochemical expert by any means, but I, I found well, the study. That's what I'm wondering. And I, okay, so now I am, so this this actually wasn't wasn't the work you're reporting, which makes sense because- Oh, sorry, yeah, this is not- You're not gonna be able to get that from <laughs> the N3C. I'm going <laughs> as much as one might know. Anyway, it, it's an interesting for another discussion as to where they got this data. So, uh, no, that's great. Uh, other, 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 other questions. Do you have any sense, or it would be it would be interesting actually, and I guess this would also be difficult to do. Um, I mean, it's it seems that the severity of the disease and the presentation is you know drifting more towards what you might see with other childhood diseases. I mean, if you sort of look at, um, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not a pediatrician, so I, I probably shouldn't venture, but are, what, are the, what are other childhood diseases that, you know, might have, you know, the closest to, to Omicron in, in presentation in terms of um, the upper, upper uh, respiratory tract? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, I mean, there are specific viruses, so parainfluenza, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, and even non-SARS-CoV-2 coronaviruses like NL63, those are you know, very well known and documented for causing laryngotracheal bronchitis. I think it's challenging because we have so much better epidemiologic data on, on SARS-CoV-2 as compared to, you know, test. We most institutions don't even test for parainfluenza. It's not part of their viral panel. Um, and so you'll see testing for that done in the ICUs, which then gives you a, a skewed sample. Um, but I, I agree. I mean, it would be interesting to look at uh, the sort of prevalence of patients who get hospitalized or who have severe disease and specifically compare children who have a positive SARS-CoV-2 test to children who have negative SARS-CoV-2 testing, but also have like RSV or paraflu. I think that that would be a really interesting study. And to my knowledge, that's not something that's been done yet. So I, I appreciate that idea. <laughs> oh, no, great, great talk. All right. So I think, I think that's it. Am I missing anything? All right. Well, thanks for a great talk, and I think uh, Ken, you're you're up. You're up now. Thank you, Joel. I'm going to share my screen. That was a really wonderful presentation. I'm very much appreciated. Um, can you all um, see my slides now? I'm putting them mm -hmm. in present presentation mode. All right. Can you all see? Still see them? Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, um, I. First of all, you know, th thank you all as always for for joining us in the forum. It's very exciting. Um, um, I'm going to present to you something completely different, um, and it's really um, a funding opportunity. But it's got it. It's got some wrinkles in it that I want to talk to you all about. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, in cats um, because of the N3C um, and credit to the community. Um, gets a lot of questions from public health officials. We often refer to one that we got from, from the White House. We've gotten another one. Um, and these are questions that are often have public policy um, issues or even some things very mundane, like should we purchase something? And the example I've used before and, and continue to use was uh, a couple months ago now, um, we got asked um, about Paxlovid rebound. Emily and Richard and um, Melissa and the team just put, dropped everything um, they were doing. And for two weeks, they they worked many nights. And they the reason the White House wanted to know this is because in the spring, they were, they had to order this drug, but it, they heard suddenly there was rebound and if people could get worse, they they couldn't, they wouldn't, didn't want to order it. And the only other study that had any Paxlovid data was only had 300 people and we had just under 20,000 at that that moment anyway the team did an amazing job and um and the white house purchased paxlovid because um we don't have the perfect answer of what paxlovid but what they needed to know is is it going to kill people and it wasn't and and we were able to answer it but the downside to that process is that it's not really fair that we ask Emily and Melissa and Richard and everybody else to drop everything they're doing to answer this is just not sustainable. So we, we have come up with a, uh, a process that I'm going to explain to you now of how can we give money 
or offer money to people who um, could could or would be willing to answer these questions in a fast way. And that's really important because when we get these questions, whoever's asking them, they need it now, of course. And so that's what I'm going to explain to you. Um, and um, so um, this, the, the thing I want to really emphasize on this is that it's, this is a contract, okay? So you, if you apply for one of these questions, and we're going to talk about that in a second, will be a contractor, okay? And that's very different from a grant. So when you see language, you're going to be referred to as the applicant uh, applying for a contract, and you will actually be a subcontractor in a prime. So I just want, can't emphasize it enough. There's a lot of reasons uh, we'll talk about why that's important. But generally speaking, it's actually very similar to what you do now. Um, uh, well, a question is going to be posted, and if you're a new person, you apply to N3C and you submit your application very much like a DUR. It'll be reviewed, and then you'll be given the award. So to, to help people out, um, and these screens are still draft, um, Dave Eichmann and his wonderful team and on have, have come up on the N3C site on a page of what these are about. So the purpose of them is to answer these questions quickly. Um, who will be able to apply? And just so you know, we, I, my leaning was to try to give it to investigators, obviously working in N3C, the CTSA, CTR, Ocean, but we're not allowed to do that. So this is an open competition. But the idea is, is that if somebody who wants to answer one of these questions um, applies, it will be reviewed and, and you'll be funded to do this work. There are a few people who can't apply just to keep the optics clear. Um, we are not going to allow um, the N3 CPIs to apply for these. We just didn't want to say that anybody was having an unfair advantage. And, and, and so other than that, though, it is open. So um, basically, um, another page, which you'll find, which will be on the dashboard. This is, again, a mock-up, but I have these squares over it because it's got real questions in it. When questions come available, and questions can come from lots of different places, from the White House, from NCATS, from the community, um, it's a pressing question that needs to be answered. Um, NCATS will decide if they're going to fund that, and, and, and we'll talk about how that's done in a second. But if a question is to be funded, you will find the question available on the, um, you know, N3C has two big places. There's the public health um, site, um, kind of the dashboard site, and there's the, the website. So the details of how, of what this is are in the website, but this will actually be on the public health dashboard. And you'll see the question and you'll click on the question like I'm here, and it'll take you to the question. And the questions are divided kind of into two sections. There's the applicant information. Oops, I'm sorry. In the applicant information, you'll see the title of what we're asking, when you can start to apply, when the applications are due, how many contracts will be awarded. So think about sometimes there'll only be one, but sometimes there'll be many people who will be awarded. So that's where you'll see that. How much money that you'll be paid to do these. Um, I. I put on here estimated dollar amount because in this case, 50,000 and most of them be between 25 and $100,000, depending on the complexity of the question. Um, but it's an estimated dollar amount because just the way contracts are negotiated in may end up being $49,992. So, but it, it'll be in when you see that's why you'll see estimated again, a kind of a contracty language. The length of the contract, it's in this example, it's two months. So once you apply, and you are awarded the contract, and you have your workspace done, you will have two months. So we do know that working with institutions takes a while. So that won't count against the time. Obviously, we'd love to have that done quicker, but there's no way to control that. But you will be told what how much time you have. And then what we're looking for. So there'll be the title of the, of the we'll call it the contract description. Um, a little bit more details of it. And I put this in small font because I don't want you to read it. Um, the aim of the contract, what will be in the inclusion, exclusion, phenotype if applicable, expected results if applicable, method or statistical um, uh, uh, if applicable, deliverables, which will always be there. So I just want to explain when I say if applicable. So this is kind of like a mini protocol. Many times the question will not make sense that we define what 
we in cats to find what the phenotype is. But other times, let's say we want to reproduce an exact study. We're going to say, please use the phenotype method that was done by this study, and then we will give you the details, right? Or expected results. We want to see if the results will match this exactly. Other times, most of the time, it'll say this is really up to the, the um, person applying to tell us how they want to do it. But that, but they're there. Um, so if, if NCATS needs to be more specific, it'll be there. So I just, and then I want to just go over this last one, the deliverables. And I'll talk about this again in a second. Deliverables are what you as the awarded subcontractor will give to NCATS so we can take that information and post it on um, N3C's dashboard, the public health part of the dashboard, because our goal in this, NCATS goal in this, is to get the answer out to the public as soon as question, as soon as possible, because somehow this ro rose a level of a question that's important. If you as an investigator want to write a paper, there is no prohibition to doing that, but that is not what we're looking for as a deliverable. It's really a set of tables, and we'll tell you exactly what they are, with you know a description of what you did, short, um, uh, and then limitations. You know, uh, so no, it is not a paper. Okay, so how do you apply? So magically, when we open this up, um, there'll be a new button on the dashboard. It'll see public health application. In it, when you click on it, um, you will see the exact same information that Dave Eichmann is going to put on his on the. Uh, website because you can look at the, th the things that are available also at N3C. So you'll see the applicant information, just exactly what I just talked about, and the exact same fields here. Then if you say, I want to apply, you will pick, let's say there's six questions, you will pick the question that you want to answer, right? The name of your project is going to be, let's say it, the public health question is Paxlovid by Dr. Salts, it'll be public health. The name of your application will be Paxlovid by Joel Salts. That will be the name of it because you're picking the question that you're answering, right? But this, because if there's two contracts, we want to make sure that Joel's work is different, for instance, my work. And you'll answer four questions. And here are the four questions. Very DUR like, but they're different questions. What's expected in the questions, again, this will be on, on the N3C website, is, is defined here. But basically, it's answering that 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 announcement. Then you can add very just like you before. You can add collaborators if you know if you want here or later. The, uh, it's up to you. No difference here. And then you're going to answer your attest attestation questions. No difference from before. So, but there's it is level three data, but it's automatically level three data. But you don't need an IRB because this is for NCATS. This isn't again is a contract. Now, if you want to write a paper on it, you can just, we're working on exactly if we can make this easy as possible, but in essence, you will just put in a DUR at that point, because it's level three, it'll be just like the regular rules, whether you have to get your local IRB, or, and we will move that information to that new workspace or, or however we, we handle that. But for this work, you will not need a local IRB. So... Okay, so anyway, then it will be, once you put it in, it'll be reviewed and you'll get an email. And then when you give it the results, we're gonna put it up on the dashboard um, uh, so everybody can use it. So I've, this slide, I wanna kind of go over in detail because it will little walk us through a little bit of this so you all understand this. So a public, a question is posted. We talked about it. You'll find on the N3C website, it's also in the, within the the palette within the enclave but either place you will you will submit a response that kind of somewhat dur like um uh uh uh, 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 uh thing um uh i'm sorry so in, i'm sorry I'm, let me start again the, the 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 um let me explain what this is i'm so sorry let me take a second community these are swim lanes if you've never seen one of these in cats is what in cats job is this is the community's job this is a prime contractor whose name is Axel, we're going to talk about. And this is you, if you apply, the subcontractor. So these are swim lanes. So um, the questions are posted. We just talked about that. People apply, right? Um, it's evaluated. But look who's doing the evaluation. You see, it's in the swim lane of the 
prime contractor whose name is Axel, and you will be a subcontractor to Axel. So in order for us to do this and, and be, um, you know, follow the rules uh, of the federal government rules, it has to go, there has to be a separation uh, where you're the subcontract to a prime contract. So that this group will actually be leading you through and you will be working through them and the money will come through them. So once you've applied and you've been awarded, they, Axel will get in contact with you and they will work with your business official to get the contract going. They'll also work with you as the person doing the investigation on, um, you know, what, you know, helping you get you, get you set up. How do you get help? Um, they'll do a mid, a mid contract review to make sure you're going the right direction. They'll help you with the results. Um, they'll do all of those things. So when you're, once you've signed it and you've done the work, this group, Axel Group will be a, kind of a, a, kind of a project offer, sir, play that role. Once you've finished it and you've gotten it approved, your results go out and then it goes posted to N3C website. So this is what's the weird thing about it. It's not a grant, it's a contractor. And the person, instead of a project officer helping set up a grant and taking that role, you'll have a contractor working with you on this as a subcontract. So I want to stop and, and see if that made sense to everybody. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a twist. It's a very nice mechanism for NCATs to be able to move things quickly because you can imagine if we had to make up an FOA and open this up, it would take years and COVID would be over and most of our children have gone to college. So, you know, it's really nice to be able to do this quickly, but it does have these wrinkles. So I just wanted, I should say, when will this be available? The first two questions, we're ready to go. I just need to get final sign off. Some, we're very close. I, I'm hoping this week, maybe next week, I keep saying this week after week, but it's, it's coming very close. So is there any questions on this? So Ken, that, that's really fascinating. That's very that's a very cool mechanism. Um, so one one question I'm sure most people out in academia land uh, would wonder about is um, what's what is the mechanism for um, reviewing these 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 um, these proposals? Uh, uh, it, it's a good question. So the the contractor staff does have scientific expertise. Ultimately, in CATS, it's not a DAC anymore. It's reviewed by the contractor for initial um, potential, and then ultimately, in CATS, in an internal DAC, so to speak, will review it. It's really our staff will say, "Yes, this is giving us what we want." So um, it's kind of a DAC. So it's the in, so the NCAT staff fundamentally, obviously, yeah. if if there's one response, the question is, is it adequate? If there's 17 responses, then somebody has to say, you know, rack and stack of these things and decide what, what group or groups would might be best. That's right, that's right. So great, okay. So Tom, Harold, if it's a contract, this will fall under co and core. I don't actually quite know what that means, but maybe you do. Um. I'm not sure I understand it either. Oh, there. Oh, yeah, Tom. Yeah, Tom. It. Um. Uh. Stewart will be. Um. Be, will be the co a core on this. Okay. Uh, does that sound like the rest of us need to know what that means? <laughs> well, Maybe not. And and I'm sorry, Joel. That's. It, it, sorry, that was silly. Mm -hmm. in, inside NIH. So you know we have staff that helps at, in the federal government does grants, and then we have a, a parallel staff that does contracts. And the who does con in that kind of parallel works force is a contracting officer as opposed oh, to a okay uh, okay a project officer. It, it it's it's basically just a parallel. Oh okay, no, that's beautiful. And yeah. so it falls under contracts. It's it's a contract. <laughs> okay, so okay then Claudine uh, Jerkowitz, what 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 will be the time frame between publication of the question? Uh, and expected answer with the proposal by the investigators. Okay, so how long do you want to give people to respond? Yeah, so in that, in that, one of the slides I was showing, there's that little panel that said applicant information. It'll say you have to apply, and it'll say the open date of application. We'll just say, for example, November 1st, applications close, let's say November 15th. Totally made that up. Everyone will be different, right? Every every question will be different. Every question. You'll say how long you'll get people to respond. Yeah, we, we'll have yeah, 
And then every question will also say how long you have once the contract in your workspace is provisioned to deliver it. And as part of that will be what results are expected. So each question will fill out that kind of, I want to call it a protocol. It's not really a protocol, but you know, all, all the this particulars of the, of the question. So then one question I'm sure you thought about, you alluded to this, but um, so if institutions will vary in how quickly they can turn out around the paperwork. So uh, presumably at some point, given that these are questions you need to have answered, I'm sure you're going to have to say, look, you know, beyond a certain point, the institution isn't being responsive. It's not always the fault of the PI or if you... I, you know, so 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 I know that that's a tricky business. Do you um, have you thought about how you're going to deal with that? Um, it's it's that Joel, you you kind of hit the nail on the head. It, it's definitely the right rate limiting step, and and we know that the investigator really has no control, and that's not fair to them. But at the same time, we're getting pressure to answer these. So, um, you know, there. There will be a point where, yes, it says, you know, you just can't, you can't answer it and we're going to go to the second one down. Or if we, you know, because they're contracts and we know somebody's working in this area and they're ready to go and, and they've already had a contract and the White House says, I need this tomorrow, we may just go to them. We, and that, that'll give us that flexibility given the pressure that we're under um, at mm -hmm. the time. So it, that's one of the reasons the contract allows us to have some flexibility. But mm -hmm. I'm hoping as, as we get better at doing this, and then we find other ways to fund investigators, this is one of one more me one mechanism. But we could use it for other things that we're planning on. So we'd love to see if this can work. It is an experiment. I'm not saying it's not. I do imagine that the sites, once they do one of these, if they if somebody at their institution bids on a second one, they'll be oh yeah, the same thing, right? And they'll sign off on it quickly. So I'm yeah, no, no, I, it's very exciting. And, yeah. and let me just, this is my own point of view and people obviously may not agree, but I, I think it can be useful to institutions, um, sort of all the ones I've been at, uh, if the funder is explicit about response has from the institution has to be within X weeks or whatever it is, because uh, then is generally, uh, at least what I've seen, um, research offices will look at it. Okay, when does when does the um, funder uh, require a response, and then work around those deadlines. Work so, out, yeah. yeah. So explicitness is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you might you might add a little bit of forgiveness if if it goes up or a little bit. But thinking of, uh, I, I mean, I think most of us with research officers, offices, which we all do obviously have, uh, we can say, okay, I mean, it can't be like, you know, 10 minutes. I mean, it's got to right, be something. Right. Otherwise, they'll say, no, I'm sorry, we just can't do it. But if it's something within the range of what a, 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 an academic research office could do, it's it's probably better to have something explicit than, than, than not. But that's just my, that's no, just my good advice. Okay, so let's see. Lee Piles, I'm not sure I understand. What are the two draft questions? Can't announce them here. Open competition. Okay, so I'm not sure if you have anything to say on that. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, what are the two draft? Oh, um, oh, I'm sorry. They're already. We've already know the first two questions. So I I put little blocks of over them so you couldn't see them because I can't open it up just to you guys. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so those are real questions that, that okay. we're ready to go with. It's, it's the paperwork I can't get, seem to get done. So cool. that, that's no, what, no, that, no, no. No, they're, that they're, yeah. And then the other question I think somebody had, that was a good question, just to be clear. Um, well, that's a really good question. Um, is it with the, yeah, the contract generally will be with probably an institution you do have to have it that institution has a, have a DUA not that that's a, a big hurdle but remember this is will be an open competition so I guess it could be with an individual um but it generally speaking I'm imagining um it will be with some sort of organization and and, and I'm, I'm you know hoping that um obviously I want want to make sure that you know, I'm trying to get, we, we want to get support back to the community that's given us so much. So, so I'm hoping we get good response from the CTSA, CTR, and Ocean, and all the other folks who've been working on this. Great. 
Okay, let's see. So uh, do we have any chat questions? No, I think so. This is this is really intriguing. I think it could be quite a precedent for uh, this sort of thing. And, and I definitely can see that um, the flow and complexity of questions having having some sort of a funding mechanism tied to that, you know, really could hopefully make the whole uh, thing much more sustainable. So I definitely can see that. Yeah, and I really, if this works, I think we we can use this again for lots of a lot. There's a lot of opportunities if we can make this work. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's okay. I did. Um, I you know we're this is still there's still some loose ends. We're gonna clean them up. Um, in three C, we'll have all this information on their website. Um, and again, it'll also be available. Um, the questions will be available inside the in enclave and outside. Um, I do have one other um, plug that I, I'm, I, you know, I, I should have been in advertising. Um, the CMS data will be linked and it's starting. Um, we want, it'll probably be available starting November 1st. So please um, get your pens ready to submit a DUR and use that. It's pretty exciting. It's um, uh, Medicare information. Um, we will hope to have Medicaid um, probably in the first quarter, we're hoping, but it's a big deal. Um, but that also brings me, I ask, I'm just asking in general, we'll be sending out a letter to sites that have not agreed to allow us to link their data to PPRL, please asking your PIs or whoever at your institution can sign that. It's free to do it. It's really easy to set it up, less than a day's worth of work. Um, and the process, once it's set up, is we you can put on over a million hashes in less than a minute. So it's just not a lot of work. But without that, without that ability to link, the CMS data is linked. We don't pull it in. We only link CMS data to existing N3C people. So if our sites don't allow us to link it, then the CMS data won't be linked and it will be significantly less valuable. So this is my, my beg uh, to the community to, to go to your, your, the powers that be and get them to sign that linkage on this broker agreement that we sent out. Um, there'll be a letter coming out to the sites that haven't signed out in about a week. We wanted to tie it to the CMS data release. So it was fresh in people's mind, but um, uh, uh, you know, uh, and any questions about what we just talked about, please send them my way. I'm happy to answer them. Great. Okay, well, Ken, well, thank you. This was very exciting. Very, very, um, I think the a lot of, a uh, tremendous amount of interest in this and very innovative. So, um, so that's great. Okay, anything else anybody wants to talk about? Okay, well, thanks, Blake. Thanks, thanks, Ken, and have a great week, and see you next week. Thank you. Bye.